into the book of James, and we're going to be spending uh, some time here as we get ready for Easter in about a month and a half. So we'll be zooming through James here a little bit, not too fast, because after Easter's over, we got to come back and finish James. So we're taking our time in James. It's a very small book, but a very powerful book. It's very practical for you and me uh, in our Christian life. I have the flowers here today as we think about people in Ukraine. As we think about their suffering, uh, you probably have seen a lot of photos with the sunflowers and the idea of just remembering the people in Ukraine. I, I've been following a couple Christian groups that are making their way out, uh, moving from Odessa and other places, uh, working to uh, get out of you know, very uh, heated areas. So we want to continue, especially we want to pray for everyone, but especially when we think about our brothers and sisters in Christ uh, who are suffering today. You know, I was thinking about that yesterday we took the grandkids up to Gettysburg and you know we're sitting there and we're eating a sandwich and I thought wow we don't even understand it in America we don't understand it you know we're sitting here and we're relaxed there's no problem nobody's trying to overtake anything we're enjoying the food we enjoyed what we did yesterday and at the same time not only in Ukraine but around the world our brothers and sisters in Christ, many of them are suffering, many of them are facing difficulty. So we definitely want to remember them in prayer and I think it's appropriate today as we put our sunflowers here as a reminder, James chapter two, verses uh, 13, as we look at verses 13, uh, or excuse me, verses eight to 13, we're gonna take a small portion of scripture but see a powerful message here about love, impartial love. James will talk a lot about faith Faith and works. When you read the Apostle Paul and you read the books of the New Testament, you read a lot of passages about faith. For example, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you are saved through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And then you come to the book of James and you find words like our works without faith or faith without our works is dead. And so in our Christian life, our works do not save us. Our works do not uh, give us a kind of a checkoff thing where, okay, I've done this, I accomplished that. But what we live out, our sanctification, what we live out day by day in the works that we demonstrate show the fact that our life has been changed by Jesus Christ. My salvation is in Christ. The evidence of my salvation is how I live and serve him. And so when that becomes awry and when I'm not doing well in living out or serving him, I need to stop and check myself because I might not be doing well as a believer or there might be some people who say, well, you know, I was raised in church and, and we were taught to do good works, that good works will someday please God and good works will get us into heaven. And yet how deluded they are because the word of God shows us very clearly that it's by grace that you have been saved. And so we want to make sure today we have a balance at Genesis Church. We want to understand from these verses this morning, what does it mean to have impartial love? I'm going to have two major points and just a few in between, but two major points as we go along here and we look at this portion of scripture. Do you realize this morning that if Genesis Church in this community knew how to love each, other's, each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, we would probably see more people coming to Jesus? Do you realize if we really lived out what God says is biblical love, we would have a testimony that would transcend what is going on in the world and people would want to know and ask questions and maybe many would receive the message of salvation. That's what these verses are about this morning. These verses are to help you and me get a perspective of what impartial love looks like how do we live that out as believers in this world so that the unsaved people around us, the people who are seeing us every day, realize that there will be something different in your life and my life. So I'm sure as we go through these passages of scripture, the Holy Spirit of God will do his job in our hearts. I ask you, I challenge you, I pray today that we as the believers of Jesus Christ would open our hearts to the Holy Spirit this morning, that we would say, Lord God, I hear Pastor Bob's voice, but you're hitting my heart. You listen to the heart more than the voice. 
Okay, listen to the heart more than the voice as the Holy Spirit of God works in you. And Lord, you know, you know, Lord, you know that we all need to do better. We all need to grow better. Maybe you don't know Jesus yet and you're watching or you're sitting here in the auditorium and you would say, Pastor Bob, I don't know if anyone really loves me. Well, Jesus Christ does. And I hope today that you will see that the Lord Jesus Christ cares about you and you might be sitting here today feeling not loved. You may be sitting here today feeling alienated from anyone who has ever loved you and yet God says, I love you. God got you here for a purpose. God has you tuned in this morning for a purpose because the Holy Spirit of God wants to talk to you about your salvation your salvation. So let's jump right in here and let's look here at this impartial love. And the first thing, the first major point is that impartial love is foundational to a personal faith plus living faith, plus living love. When you look at James chapter two, verse eight, it says here, if you really fulfill the royal love of all, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. Now we wanna back up here for a minute because remember a few weeks ago, I said James, like every other New Testament book, was not written with chapters and verses. It is one letter. So let's back up and get our context again in James chapter one, verse 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Here we see that loving people, which involves loving God, is more important than being religious. Religion means nothing but gives us a formality of a sacredness to practice. And I say that because not even in our sacredness may we be worshiping God. We can create the gods of our own understanding. We can build stone churches of our own understanding. And yet forget that the power of God is not in the brick and mortar, but it is in the living power of Jesus Christ. And so we find here that for you and I today, we need to understand that pure religion and undefiled before God is loving people. Look at James chapter uh, two and look at verse one. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. This morning we tried to create a little smoke up here on the stage and that is only to remind you of what James is saying here because the word glory here is the word we see in the Old Testament of the Shekinah glory of God. When the Shekinah glory of God landed on the tabernacle, when the Shekinah glory of God filled the temple, when the Shekinah glory of God dwells in these temples of clay, as we accept Jesus, this is a temple the Holy Spirit resides in. And when we look at this portion of scripture, what James is saying here in chapter two and verse one is, <clears throat> show no partiality as you hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, Shekinah glory, Shekinah glory. You and I, as the Genesis church, as the church of Jesus Christ, we are to walk in this world. We are to live in a way that demonstrates the Shekinah glory that dwells in this temple of clay, that dwells in the person of the Holy Spirit who indwells us at the moment of salvation that we might be redeemed and live for him. And then as we move along, we come to our text now and we come to James chapter two and verse eight. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. When we go back, and these are verses you hear me talk about, these verses mean a lot to me. When I think about doing community work as a church, when I think about reaching out to people, I go to Leviticus chapter 19, verses one to 18 are key verses for me in my own personal life to help me keep a perspective of not to forget my community and to not forget the people who live in my community. And when I look at verse 18, it says there, you shall not take vengeance. <coughs> and if someone would not mind getting me some water, 
If you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself, I am the Lord. That's what's quoted in the New Testament when God says, when Jesus tells us that not only do we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, but we love our neighbor as ourselves. That is taken right out of Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is taken right out from that passage of scripture. So here we see the royal law. Here we see this high law, according to the scripture, is that we shall love our neighbor as ourself. I already mentioned in the book of Luke chapter 10, verse 27, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Mark chapter 12, verses 29 to 31, Jesus answered, the most important is here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is like this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the foundation from Old Testament to New Testament to the book of James is here for Genesis Church this morning. We must grasp the love of God. We need to demonstrate the love of God. How can I demonstrate the love of God? It's because I know the love of God as we, because Jesus is my savior. And because I know salvation, because I know redemption, because I have been set free, I am able now to love others. I am able to be impartial in my love. Look here in verse eight, and we see a couple things in chapter two of James. If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scriptures, you are doing well. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. A couple things here under this point of comparing scripture from the Old Testament to the New Testament to the book of James. He says here, you. It is a message of individualism. It is a message of individualism. Yes, it's the whole body of Christ, but I, Pastor Bob, has to stop you, this impartial love, this foundation of faith and of love that needs to come from your life. You personally need to check to see if that love is there. You need to know whether you have received Jesus Christ as your savior and how are you living out that love of God, not only showing that love toward God, but showing that love toward others. And then he uses the word love. It is an action word. It is agape. It is God's standard. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we read about that biblical love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we're reminded in this portion of scripture, it says, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. And so what I need to do in my life, as I want to examine my life, as I want to grow in my relationship with the Lord, as I want to grow in loving God and people, I need to look at things I've talked about before. I need to look at my thoughts. I need to look at my words and I need to look at my actions and I need to write them down and I need to think about them and then I need to take all those things that I write down and I need to throw them up against 1 Corinthians 13. And that is God's standard of love in 1 Corinthians 13. And so when I put my actions and my words and my thoughts up against the word of God, I will know whether I'm passing the test or failing the test. I will know that. I will know if I am impartial in my love to other people. Now, you know, I can't tell you what other people talk about when Pastor Reggie and Kelvin and I go to a couple rehab centers during the week in York. I can't tell you what people talk about. I can tell you what I talk about. 
And I wanna tell you what I talk about because you'll be able hopefully to relate to your life in some of the things God works on and wants to work on in your life. So when I'm there and, and we're all sharing and we're all talking and we're all walking through the different things that we do, I often share, I am one of those people who have an avoidant personality, okay? As a task person, I can get lost in my world. Okay, everybody jokes with me, and I think I'm doing better as your lead pastor, but everybody jokes with me about not being a hugger, okay? Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, we task people, we like our space. Now, I'm saying that jokingly because I gotta be careful too that I'm not insensitive to people, okay? But here's what happens to me, okay? Here's what happens to me, and my wife, she's smart, and she catches this right away, okay? The first thing I do is shut down. The first thing I do is get quiet. For people who know me, if we're together and I'm quiet, something's wrong, okay? Because normally I'll have this dry sense of humor or I'll tell some of the crazy stories, you know, or things I've done, you know, I, I, I have dry sense of humor kinda. But when I back off, and I'm quiet, and my wife will say, okay, what's going on? You know, what's happening here? Okay, that's the first sign. The second thing, I begin the ant process. Automatic negative thoughts. I take something simple, and I take it out of extreme, to an extreme in my head. That's what automatic negative thoughts do. They create all or nothing situations. They create judgmental situations. They create all types of scenarios in your mind. And so here's what happens, follow along. I'm over here, for some reason, I take a step, I'm moving away from you. I take another step because I know I'm okay and you're crazy and that's all I'm thinking about, okay? <laughs> So I move over in that direction, and then I withdraw, I withdraw. Maybe I'll go to the plan of fitness. Maybe I'll go upstairs and take a nap in my chair. Maybe I'll, you know, I'll just withdraw. And then I will uh, not say a whole lot. Please don't ask me a lot of questions, I'm not answering them. Because you see, here's the problem with us avoiding people. We don't need any of you. You know, that's how, you see on the other side of that are the anxious people who need people. We call them people pleasers. You know, they gotta have people, they need that approval. The avoidant person doesn't need that. I can go over here and do my thing. But you know what each one of them is doing in their way? They're isolating themselves more and more. And then, um, then I look for personal reward. I'm just gonna eat. By the way, I was at, you know, I told you I went to the doctor. I was really happy. I was scared to death. I've avoid, I avoided my doctor, Dr. Hoadley, for a whole year, you know, and they finally called up with me because they wouldn't refill my prescriptions until I came in. So, you know, so I was in there on Friday, you know, and, and we were talking. And by the way, just my little nasal stuff and my spray, what I talked about earlier, is about it. She put up my blood pressure medicine a little bit. My heart and lungs, all that stuff is really good. I told her, Dr. Holdley, I was so happy because for now it's two and a half months. I have not been to a fast food place. I have not eaten, drank iced tea. It's two and a half months. But see what I can do, that, that, that's, not a, that's a battle because see, that's where I could go for comfort. That's where I could go for comfort. It's not just being alone, it's going for comfort. But you know what happens? When I put all of that that I just described to you up against 1 Corinthians 13, you know what God says? Pastor Bob, you're not very loving, you're selfish. Selfishness is a heart issue to someone who avoids and goes their own way to do whatever. So I know that to love impartially, I have to check myself through my thoughts, words, and actions. And as I check myself through my thoughts, words, and actions, I'm able to come back and say, okay, God, I'm going the wrong path. I gotta get back into this situation. So what do I do? What do I do when I get there? Well, my staff knows this. I have to have face-to-face -face conversation. 
See, that's a way that helps me to be able to hear people. That's why I say to all of you, come see me. If you're thinking about something, come and talk to me about it. I'm not gonna bite you as an avoidant person I need in the conversation. So I don't go awry. And so uh, I'll say, you know, come and talk to me. Or what I do is, Lord God, who can I bless today? Who can I say, I don't want my left hand knowing my, my, what my right hand is doing? Who can I bless today, whether that's financially or some other way? Lord, how can I give today? I put myself back into people because if I avoid, I get into trouble. And if I'm avoiding, I am not loving as God says I should love. And I am sinning against God. And then I'm sinning against the people that I'm around. And I have to work on that. Do you have to work on that? Anybody got to work on that? It's kind of quiet out there. You all must be okay. Hey, I got a multitude of counselors out here. All right. Uh, that's great. But you see what I'm saying? So when I look at this portion of scripture here, the word about love is agape, that I need to love my neighbor as myself. I need to love my neighbor as myself. When I do that, verse eight says, I am doing well. Look at Luke chapter 10 again. Jump back to uh, Luke chapter 10, and this time verses 30 through 37. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place where he saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him. He bound up his wounds. He poured on him oil and wine. This good Samaritan wasn't an avoidant person. He reached right in there to help. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denera and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So we find here that on this rugged 17 mile terrain from Jerusalem to Jericho, this is a place where robbers would hang out. And if you were caught by yourself, or maybe caught with uh, some goods that they wanted, they would rob you, beat you up, and probably leave you to die because they really didn't care. And that's what happened to this man. He was beat up and he was left to die. Now, two things happen here. I see two types of people here. The first group of people or people that I see are the church workers. And the second that I see here is a generous foreigner. Why do I say it that way? Because in our world, 21st century America, Western culture, we have developed in the church what the world has developed, and that is a me mentality. If it doesn't work for me, if it doesn't make me happy, if it doesn't make me feel good, if it doesn't make me excited, and everything can in Christianity become like the world, me, 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 me. The two churchgoers, the Pharisee and the Levite, go walking by and they walk on the other side. The generous foreigner comes and he sees the situation and as we read, is willing to help. We need to learn from the generous foreigner, not the churchgoers. Because the churchgoers today in America are sending a wrong message to a lost world. And we need to get back to impartial love. We need to get back to a foundation where our faith and practicing love is something that is seen. And then the Bible says there in verse eight, you do well. Another thing that we see here in verse nine, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So here James is showing us something I told you we would talk about as we go through the book of James. <clears throat> we're gonna talk about put-ons and we're gonna talk about put-offs. Verse eight 
is what I should put on. Verse nine is now what I need to put off in my life. So if I'm going to be impartial in my love, I put on verse eight and I put off verse nine. And verse nine again is showing partiality. Sin rises up when there's a lack of love. When sin rises up in my life and it rises up against you, and I let it rise up against you and me and it comes between my relationship with God and my relationship with you, I am going to sin against you. I'll blast your name everywhere I can blast it. I'll gossip about you in the secret places. I'll do whatever I can to make you look like a fool because it's all about me. And when I show that kind of lack of love, I am sinning against the word of God. I am sinning against the law of God. When I look at that verse nine, I also realize spring, sin springs up from wrong motives. We're not gonna turn to James chapter four this morning because we'll be preaching on that down the road. But James chapter four, verses one to 11, it talks about why I do things. And if I do things out of wrong motives, God's not going to answer my prayer. So if I'm disrespecting you and devaluing you as a person, it's because of my motive. I'm protecting me. That is sin against God. I remember one time, a couple, this goes back five or six years. Maybe I've shared this story before, I don't know. But I was meeting with a guy, he was 22 years old. Uh, he was in college and he had a girlfriend and she broke up with him. And he was mad because he wanted nothing more to do with church because God wouldn't give him a girlfriend. And he was in my office and he was telling me that he prays to God and he's asking God for a girlfriend. In fact, he wants the girl back that broke up with him. You know, and he's bugging her and he's harassing her and stuff like that. And, and, and he says, I just don't want any more to do with God because God won't answer my prayers. I'm not believing in God anymore. I took him to James chapter four. I said, here's your problem. You're asking out a wrong motive. It's not that God may not have someone out there for you, but sometimes God says no to the desires of our heart because he has something better. We can't see it yet, but he has something better. Well, he didn't want to hear that, and I think we met a couple times, and he was gone, so I'm not sure if he ever got his prayers answered or not. But anyway, we find here that when I deliberately, and that's the idea of sin here, when he, in, in verse 9, when James calls that sin, it is a deliberate act. It is a deliberate act when I hurt you. It is a deliberate act when I hurt God. And what we sometimes don't understand, if I hurt you, I sin against God too. I'm not just coming to make something right with you. I got to go before God and make that right. And so we find here that we got to be careful to put off partiality. We want to put on love. And another thing I see in these verses here as I compare the scriptures, Old and New Testament, I find that if we're not careful, if we stumble over one point of the law, we are guilty of everything. Look at James chapter two, verse 10. For whoever keeps the whole law, but fails in one point has become accountable for it all. I can't take the word of God and say, okay, God, I'm partial over here. I'm living in my avoidance. I don't want to be around people. I don't want to talk to them. I'm better than they are, blah, blah, blah. And say, oh Lord, it's Sunday morning. We're going to worship today. God says it doesn't work that way. Because if you're over here living like this, don't you come in thinking we're okay. But we do that in the American church. We compartmentalize sin. And we say it's okay to do it over here. <coughs> I'm okay over there. And God says, no, you're not according to verse 10. If you violate in one area, you have violated the whole law. Do you see how strong the word of God is? Oh my goodness, Holy Spirit, we may need to talk today. That's probably what we're all thinking right now. We may need to talk today because some things are just not right. Go back to Luke chapter 10 again. Take you back to that passage of scripture and this time to verses 25 to 29. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, Jesus, saying, teacher, what shall we do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? 
He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He knew the Old Testament. He knew Deuteronomy 6, Leviticus 19. And he said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. But he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And that's where we get into the Good Samaritan that I read earlier. All this lawyer wanted, he didn't want to reconcile with God. He wanted to argue his point. All this lawyer wanted to do was come out on top and he thought he could trip up Jesus. And he couldn't do it when Jesus said, go and do likewise. He walked away. He walked away. And so we find here, we got to be careful because if we stumble over one point of the law, we're stumbling over all. And then look at James 2.11, for he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. I got to be careful about my stumbling because it shows my lack of love. It shows my lack of love. I have to be careful about that stumbling. And so I need to make sure I am loving God and loving people. I put this cross up to demonstrate something. When I am seeking to make things right with God, what do I need to do? I am here and God is up there. It's a vertical relationship, isn't it? When I am convicted by God because I hurt you, I may be over there and you're over here, I need to come. That's a horizontal relationship. You know what I see in this cross? I see that when I look up to God and I look at you, I see forgiveness. The cross, Satan hates it. It is the most powerful symbol in Christianity because on the cross, the power of forgiveness was displayed. And God says, have that relationship with me. Have that relationship with one another. And you will practice forgiveness. You will practice forgiveness. I want to encourage you as you look at verse 9 that we need to make sure in verse 10 and verse 11, we need to make sure we keep ourselves from stumbling. The second major thing, the second major thing about this impartial love, it's foundational to fulfilling scripture. It's foundational to fulfilling scripture. Look at verses 12 and 13. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. What is James saying here? That if I live out my freedom in Jesus, I am practicing the law of liberty. But when I fail to live out my love for God and people, I am practicing the law that's going to put me under judgment. That's what verses 9 through 11 were about. But James says, don't get caught up living your life in a way where you do not love God or do not love people. Show that impartial love to God. Show that impartial love to people because then you will be set free. It's liberating. It's liberating. And so I need to do that without partiality. I need to make sure that I am loving God, continuing to live in liberty, that is found in Jesus Christ. Bible faith reveals itself in love. I have faith, but I work out my salvation in showing love. Pastor Jeff is going to come here and sing a song in a moment. It's going to be our invitational song, Loving God, Loving People. As he sings that song, maybe in this auditorium, you need to cross the aisles to make something right with someone. Maybe you need to be down at this altar because you have someone who lives far away, a family member, you know, a neighbor, a coworker, and you need to ask God to help you practice the law of liberty, the law of forgiveness, the law of love, the law of impartial love. Maybe you have someone today and they, they won't forgive you. All you can do is forgive them in your heart. You can't do any more. I know people, you know people, they will never forgive you because all they want to do is prove you wrong. But you forgive them. What does that mean then? That means if I'm driving down 616 
and somebody is stuck on the road who I know does not want to accept my forgiveness, if I have forgiven them in my heart, I will stop and offer to help their flat tire. That's what that means. Because it's about me loving someone. It's not whether someone loves me. And that's tough because we live in a generation that's all about me. And it's real tough. But you know what? We don't have to be that way at Genesis Church. We don't have to be that way in our community. We can be a church that lives in the law of liberty and the world in our community knows that we love God and we love people and we're going to work on that and we're going to mold that. We're going to make that. It's going to happen because that's the direction we want to go. I don't know what God's speaking to you about this morning because as I said at the beginning of the message, by now, not Pastor Bob, the Holy Spirit's been saying something to you through this service about loving people and loving God. We just want to open the altar that you have a chance to pray, not judge you, not come and hear your dirt. We just want to give you a chance to pray. And then if you want to talk with us, we have people, they'll be watching, people who love Jesus, walking with Jesus. I encourage you, if you love to pray with people, you want to come alongside people, you come down and pray with them. Don't wait for me to wave your hand, my hand to have you come down. You want to be used by God to speak into someone's life, you come on down here too. Put your arms around them. Pray with them, help them. Give them some encouragement today. So Pastor Jeff, okay, he's coming. And think about this. I love this song. I asked Pastor Jeff if we could do it. He said, yeah, he can do it. <laughs> you know what? But think about the words and let God work. Think about our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine. Think about what you need to do today to love God and love people.